Good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone joining in from around the world. My name is Ruben Espinosa, and it is my honor to introduce the SAA 2021 plenary panel, Shakespeare and White World Making. The four speakers who make up today's panel are not only some of the most exciting early modern scholars of our generation, but one through four scholars deeply invested in shaping our field with issues of racial justice at the fore. Arthur Little, who organized today's amazing panel, has led the way in asking us to think about the way whiteness becomes raced in the early modern period and the way Shakespeare takes on a specific whiteness in the archives, in the classroom, in the academy, and in popular imagination. It is this overarching theme that this panel seeks to explore. I won't belabor my introduction because like me, you are here to listen to our four panelists. Matthew Chapman, Assistant Professor of Theater Studies at State University of New York, New Paltz. Peter Erickson, Professor of Residence, Alice Katman Institute for the Humanities at Northwestern University. Catherine Gillen, Associate Professor of English at Texas A&M University, San Antonio. And Arthur Little, Associate Professor of English at the University of California, Los Angeles. Collectively, their work and contributions to our field cannot be overstated. They are shaping the way we think about race when we talk about race in the early modern period. To study whiteness in the early modern period is to scrutinize with discipline the very center of race making, as it allows us all to see how white world making in all its nuanced forms shape then and shapes now the way we apprehend an array of critical assumptions and practices. Of more importance, it allows us to question these critical assumptions and practices. I cannot think of a more urgent topic for our time, and I cannot think of a better group of scholars to guide us in this thinking. After the four presentations, please stay with us as we will live stream our Q&A with the panelists. Without further ado, and from this virtual space, I extend my very warm welcome to our four distinguished panelists. In this talk, I return to Shakespeare's use of the classics, building on recent pre-modern critical race scholarship to explore how the reception of Greek and Roman ideas, texts, and practices contributed to the creation of white worlds, and in particular, to a vision of white humanity and ultimately the white humanities. We often turn to Titus Andronicus and Antony and Cleopatra when we consider Shakespeare's engagement with race and the ancient Mediterranean, as they contain characters clearly marked as non-white. However, in keeping with the premise of Arthur Little's forthcoming collection, White People and Shakespeare, I am interested in exploring the race work performed in other Roman plays, particularly the way they contribute to formulations of whiteness. In what follows, I will examine Shakespeare's rendering of Roman racial regimes in Coriolanus and Julius Caesar, plays with white, quite different reception histories within the white humanist tradition. This divergence, I believe, can be attributed, at least in part, to the way that Coriolanus exposes the violence of Roman racial biopolitics, whereas Julius Caesar revises these Roman biopolitics to align both with Christian humanism and with an emerging vision of pan-European racial whiteness. The English looked to Rome as they crafted a national and racial identity. They sought to bolster their somewhat marginal status in Europe by appealing to a mythical lineage in which Britain was founded by Brutus of Troy and by applying the model of translatio imperi in which Britain would take on Rome's mantle as the world's next great empire. The English also, as Ian Smith demonstrates, appropriated Greek and Roman racial paradigms, revising them so as to endow Englishness with racial normativity and displacing England's purported barbarity onto Africans, whom they defined as racially inferior. The English, moreover, were attracted to classical political models and their attendant ideals of virtue and liberty. These ideals, however, were imbricated in Greek and Roman systems of slavery and imperialism, as the liberty and virtue of the racially superior citizen were defined against the purported servility and abasement of both the quote unquote slave and the barbarian. This framework was adapted in early modern England, which was embarking on its own colonial projects and pursuing involvement in the, in the transatlantic slave trade. As 
Urvashi Chakravarti contends, the figure of the Roman slave found frequently in pedagogical texts and in comic drama influenced English thinking about race and slavery. And as Arthur Little observes, quote, to the extent that Rome was the cultural parent to England, part of what it infused in or passed on to them was a classically derived and historically fixed whiteness deeply embedded in human freedom. Contrary to the common view, often reinscribed in early modern scholarship, that the classical world was race blind or pre racial, scholars have begun to emphasize the ways in which race functioned as an operative category in the ancient Mediterranean, particularly in Greek and Roman societies profoundly shaped by the interconnected institutions of slavery and colonialism. This is especially true if we understand race in the biopolitical sense theorized by Alexander G. Wahili, in which race functions, quote, not as a biological or cultural descriptor, but as a conglomerate of sociopolitical relations that discipline humanity into full humans, not quite humans, and non-humans. As Denise Eileen McCoskey argues, using the framework of race, quote, forces us to confront our all too frequent idealization of classical antiquity and to view more critically a variety of Greek and Roman ideologies and practices, violent facets of the ancient world that can seem too sanitized when called something else. Particularly salient in discussions of pre-modern race is Aristotle's politics, which was influential in Rome and as Deborah Sugar observed, functions as a normative central text for political theory in early modern England. Aristotle's political vision rests on his theory of natural slavery, which presents enslavability as an inherent condition for some people. Just as men were innately superior to women, according to Aristotle, free men were superior to the enslaved who were associated with the body rather than with the mind and who supposedly lacked self-control and the ability to govern themselves. The purportedly natural division of men into masters and slaves is, Aristotle argues, quote, not only necessary but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection, others for rule. For those marked for subjection, slavery is both expedient and right. Similar thinking was prevalent in Rome, where it was reinforced by the hereditary basis of Roman slavery, in which slave status was passed through the mother. Aristotle further attributes the characteristics of the enslaved to foreigners. He contrasts the freedom-loving Greeks and the Republican form of government with those to the South and East who submit to sovereign rule and are, he posits, therefore readily conquerable and enslavable. Because of their moderate character, Aristotle writes, the Hellenic race, and this is a quote, continues free and is the best governed of any nation. And if it could be formed into one state, would be able to rule the world, end quote. In this way, as Benjamin Isaac contends, quote, justification of individual slavery becomes applicable also to collective subjugation and thus becomes part of imperialist ideology, a dynamic that also works in the reverse with the subjugation of colonized people justifying the enslavement of individuals and their placement within the substratum of the less than human. The theory of natural slavery, moreover, is central to Aristotle's conception of the distinction between just and unjust rule. Although slavery itself is natural for Aristotle, the height of injustice is to enslave someone who is, quote, unworthy to be a slave, and doing so constitutes the essence of tyranny. In other words, liberty and equality are available only to those men endowed with the racial superiority implied in true citizenship, while others must be ruled absolutely. The violence of this Aristotelian framework is central to Sylvia Winter's theorization of humanism, influential within Black studies, but less recognized within the predominantly white field of early modern studies. In her essay, The Ceremony Must Be Found, Winter traces the expansion of the classical racial model throughout the early modern period, where it was reframed on a global scale in the interests of European colonialism. As she writes, if the narrow world of Hellenic civilization had its corresponding narrow sphere of encircling barbarians, the spatial growth of ancient Mediterranean civilization was accompanied by the growth of the extracultural world. With the shift of Mediterranean man into a planetary dimension, the Greek barbarians would be reconfigured 
as the homunculi natives, defined not by their lack of the Greek mode of order, but by their lack state of the first form of secular human re reason projected as isomorphic with natural reason, as the irrational chaos then to the naturally rational order of the human. Winter contends that Greece and Rome offered early modern Europeans the most salient models of a secular worldview in which man comes to take the place of God in the organization of human and natural hierarchies, now organized according to purported degrees of rationality. These hierarchies, she argues, were justified in part through Aristotelian ideas of natural slavery that deprived many people, in particular Black Africans and Indigenous Americans, of bios or political life and classified them ultimately as humanity's others. Winter's theorization of this process is germane to Shakespeare's appropriation of classical models and Winter herself turn, turns to Othello as a work that, quote, prefigures the degrading internments of under men, under classes, under peoples, under cultures. Shakespeare's Coriolanus explores the mobile line demarcating the human from the less than human within racial hierarchies of the Roman Republic. In Coriolanus, many of the patricians promote a corporeal vision of the body politic with Meninius depicting the senators as the good belly while the citizens are mutinous members and the great toe of the assembly. This political model depends upon inequality with some members conceptualized as innately subordinate, but all constituents are composed of a similar material substance joined together in the same body. The general Coriolanus, however, resists this model as he endeavors to strip rebellious commoners of citizenship. Mobilizing Aristotelian logic that equates the citizen with both racial superiority and full humanity, he describes the Roman people as monsters, animals, children, slaves, barbarians, and famously the many-headed multitude. To delegitimate their claims for justice and representation, he associates them with those who are denied citizenship. The people become contradictorily both Romans and not Romans. I would, they, they were barbarians, he rails, as they are, though in Rome littered, not Romans, as they are not, though cab in the porch of the capital. Coriolanus's rhetoric points to the treatment of the enslaved and colonized in Rome, as he suggests that the people, whom he frequently calls slaves, are akin to chattel, having been calved or littered rather than born. This less than human status in the play renders people disposable, both within and outside of Rome subject to the biopolitical power of the state as represented by Coriolanus's mailed hand, which wipes like to a harvestman that's tasked to mow or all or lose his hire. Shakespeare's rendering of dehumanizing ideologies and practices in Coriolanus is distinctly racial, although it is commonly read through the lens of Giorgio Agamben's largely race-free theory of biopolitical power which of course also derives from Aristotle's distinction between bios, political life, and zoe, bare life. As Wahili contends in his critique of Agamben, however, quote, the barring of subjects that belong to the homo sapiens species from the jurisdiction of humanity depends upon the workings of racialization and racism. In fact, the two are often indistinguishable. Or as Ruth Wilson Gilmore writes, quote, racism is the ordinary means through which dehumanization achieves ideological normality, while at the same time, the practice of dehumanizing people produces racial categories. In Coriolanus, dehumanization works not only to reify the categories of the enslaved and the barbarian as subhuman and to relegate some citizens to this sphere, but also to delimit the racial superiority of Roman citizenship, a category increasingly coded as white in the early modern period. Rather than emphasizing the ways in which Republican biopolitics can be mobilized to strip citizens of racial superiority, Shakespeare's earlier play, Julius Caesar, dramatizes the instantiation of an alternate mode in which commoners are granted racial whiteness in exchange for submission to the imperial state. The triumph of this whiteness, I suggest, is accomplished largely through Antony's transfiguration of Caesar's body from that of a deposed tyrant often racialized as dark and foreign in Republican discourse, to that of a Christ-like martyr whose whiteness and wealth are conferred upon the body politic. As Dennis Britton argues, 
The effective power of martyred bodies relies on a semiotics of color in which, quote, whiteness signifies both purity and wholeness, both of which are sacrificed in order to redeem sinful black humanity, end quote. Depictions of desecrated white bodies sullied by red blood or black and blue bruises thus recall the desecration of Christ's divine whiteness in the crucifixion and produce a racialized pathos in the Christian witness. Antony cast the bloody spectacle of the martyred Caesar in these terms, emphasizing the wounds that like dumb mouths do oak their ruby, ruby lips. Caesar's soft and white skin, an indication of physical weakness in Plutarch's lives, is transfigured to signal feminized purity within a Petrarchan discourse that, as Kim F. Hall demonstrates, employs, quote, a poetics of color in which whiteness is established, established as a valued goal. In so doing, Antony emphasizes the whiteness that can be conveyed through the martyr's blood when Romans, fulfilling their sexual and racial fantasies, quote, put a tongue in every wound of Caesar. Antony stokes the cathartic pathos inspired by the martyred body, recruiting white affects in the interests of imperial power. Connecting cleansing tears to sacrificial blood, Antony laments, had I as many eyes as thou hast wounds, weeping as fast as they stream forth thy blood, it would become me better than to close in terms of friendship with thine enemy, with thine enemies. Antony figures his tears as possessing a cleansing purgative power, and he encourages a similar response in his audience. Caesar's bleeding body, he implores, should cause the public to reject Brutus's, quote, bloody treason. And he asks them to join him in weeping penitent tears, quote, gracious drops that Antony casts as a sign of pity and thus of humanity. These cathartic tears perform a whitening function, purging not just personal sin from the individual witness, but also racialized contaminants from the community. Antony's audience is united through their collective response to Caesar's desecrated whiteness, forging effective bonds imagined in terms of the corporeal transmission of bodily fluids, particularly blood and tears, a dynamic that points to the power of theatrical catharsis in fostering white affects through its promise of purification. By extending Caesar's corporeal and spiritual whiteness to the community, Antony crafts an alternative to the conspirators' republicanism, which, prefiguring Coriolanus, restricts full racial normativity to patricians and regards plebeians as ragtag people, idle creatures, and rabblement. Antony's racial contract depends upon his promise that Roman citizens will benefit, both materially and psychically, from the imperialist projects of the state. In contrast to the Republican discourse alleging that citizens would be treated like slaves in Imperial Rome, Antony insists that citizens benefit from colonialism and slavery and that they should therefore submit to the authority of the empire rather than resist it. He reminds the people that Caesar, quote, hath brought many captives home to Rome whose ransoms did the general coffer spill. And he promises that Romans will profit both from Caesar's will and from Caesar's body from which they should, quote, beg a hair for memory to then include in their own wills, quote, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue, end quote. In this paradigm, commoners are seduced by the promise of access to whiteness as property, submitting to a violent and oppressive state in exchange for the privileges accrued from colonial expansion and enslavement. While Shakespeare interrogates this process in Julius Caesar, he is also complicit with it offering a cathartic ending that produces its own white affects and conjures a sense of racial solidarity, interpolating audiences into a broader transhistorical lineage of classicized whiteness. As Dan L. Padilla Peralta has argued, quote, far from being extrinsic to the study of Greco-Roman antiquity, the production of whiteness turns on closer examination to reside in the very marrow of the classics." End quote. This white ethos has pervaded the humanities and perhaps early modern studies in particular. It is, it is therefore incumbent upon us to reckon with this disciplinary history and with the inextricability of humanism from dehumanizing ideologies and practices, what Walter Mignolo calls the dark side of the Renaissance. When we talk about a crisis in the humanities then, 
as Kilo was on a Tompkins has recently pointed out, we must grapple with these white histories. And white scholars in particular must ask what role whiteness plays in our off-stated investment in saving them. When we talk about a crisis in the humanities then, as Kilo Wasana Tompkins has recently pointed out, we must grapple with these histories and white scholars in particular must ask what role whiteness plays in our off-stated investment in saving them. Pre-modern critical race scholarship has raised these important questions within Shakespeare studies and early modern studies. This vital body of shake race work helps us move toward a vision of early modern studies that rejects the violence of whiteness and critiques the field's deep-seated white epistemologies. In accordance with the vision proffered by Sylvia Winter, shake race pushes against the grain of Renaissance humanism to conceive of, quote, the proper sphere of the humanitas as isomorphic with the global human rather than with merely its Indo-European expression. It allows us to ask with Wahili, quote, what different modalities of the human come to light if we do not take the liberal humanist figure of man as the master subject, but focus on how humanity has been imagined and lived by those subjects excluded from this domain, end quote. Thank you. In early modern English drama, black flesh is remarkable. Yet as I sit in the university theater on a Saturday morning in fall 2019, it is the unremarkable flesh that fascinates me. While sitting in the theater observing the parade of auditioners for our spring season plays, all authored by white men, including Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, I begin to ponder the privilege of existing in a body that is unmarked and unremarkable. I shift uncomfortably in my seat, watching the largely homogenous student body march on and off the stage in a recognizable and tedious pattern of contrasting monologues, the spectrum of identities only occasionally dotted with the results of half-baked and quarter-executed diversity and inclusivity initiatives designed to recruit minorities to our campus. Each time remarkable flesh, the black flesh enters into the light, the number of which I can count on one hand, my heart sinks. While I wish them all the best, I fully recognize that our choice of productions cannot, nor is meant to serve them as individuals or relate to their experiences as racialized beings. Rather, our season, like the remainder of our curriculum, is designed to erase their flesh and their history and assimilate them into an institution that not only privileges white aesthetic ideals, but has no other language with which to speak. I know these students have little chance of being cast in any role that would challenge them as individuals or help them grow as artists. In a season of plays by white male playwrights with nothing but white characters, these remarkable bodies will be relegated to the margins, not fit to be heroes and humans, but rather set dressing that assuages the white liberal guilt of the white liberal academy. In moments like these, I can't help but to think of Toni Morrison. In playing in the dark, whiteness in the literary imagination, Morrison reminds us all how reminds us how all literature, all language, all knowledge within the American canon has the privilege of assuming an existence, quote, free of, uninformed by, and unshapen by the 400-year-old presence of first Africans and then African-Americans, end quote. Morrison argues, quote, that a real or fabricated Africanist presence was crucial to the white male author's sense of Americanness. The Africanist presence is Africanist presence is more than a tool for, as Morrison states, quote, policing matters of class, sexual license, and repression, formations and exercises of power, and medi meditations on ethics and accountability, but it is also an epistemological and paradigmatic representation of the ways in which libidinal economy constructs knowledge and desire to racialize notions of human and inhuman, of presence and absence, of life and death. This Africanist presence signals to the human subconscious negation of black being to create an unspoken and uncritiqued white normative subject. The Africanist presence also refers to the cognitive dissonance that undergirds not only the white male subject's position as humani humanity absent a qualifier, but also that undergirds the ways in which our world creates false memories of timeless whiteness. In light of the Africanist presence, the performance of whiteness in Shakespeare's England and the performance of Shakespeare through whiteness in modern America ceased existing as separate interrogations. And I began to wonder if they are in fact part of the same continuum of white thought and white world making. 
American studies and critical race theorists such as Denise Ferreira da Silva, Zakia Iman Jackson, Sadia Hartman, and Frank Wilderson have each, with varying historical and geographical points of entry and analysis, sought to understand and unpack the ways in which Blackness, particularly the specific manifestation of Blackness produced by the violence of chattel slavery, forms a foundation for the creation and constitution of the human within the paradigm of modernity. As I return to their work, I can't help but think how the works of Shakespeare, works of another tradition that existed prior to and separate from the American experiment, interact with the atemporality of blackness qua slaveness in the construction of a white world, and how our current understandings of the world influence how we remember and misremember both white history and whiteness in history. While the construction of the human vis-a-vis -vis blackness has been a has been explored primarily during the afterlives of slavery in America, rarely do these discussions, even with their signaling to a temporality, span the temporal and geographical distance between chattel slavery in America and the European countries that originated the practice. The vast majority of both scholarship on and performance of texts from early modern England un uncritically assume whiteness as an integral constituent element of the early modern English subjectivity. More often than not, studies of race in early modern England remember the present construction of white as the unspoken normative, linguistically unremarkable, unqualified human. Why do we remember the world this way? If constructions and conceptions of race in Shakespeare's day were in flux, then should the subject's racialized whiteness be in flux as any other racial category? We too often uncritically allow modern conceptions of whiteness the homogenous identity that elides natural, cultural, and class differences under an umbrella that antagonizes blackness to inform not only our reading, but our thinking of Shakespeare in the early modern world. Whether working with the text created in early modern England or recreating the text on the contemporary stage, we remember through reading, interpreting, and performing Shakespeare's work as works of whiteness. But the desirability of white flesh, of whiteness as a construct with all its semiotic connections to goodness, beauty, and humanity, relies on blackness as objection for coherence. This blackness is not just contained in the visibility of the flesh. The semantic connectedness of blackness to history, present, violence, narrative, thought, and objection, abjection renders any text to which it is inserted unreadable. Through this unreadability, we can begin to see the Africanist presence even in the works of Shakespeare. For how can we tell the story of, of Romeo and Juliet if black bodies will also make us read the story of race? The insertion of these remarkable bodies into Shakespeare's story of star-crossed lovers has the capacity to disrupt the narrative and explode their being, for even love loses its univers universality in the wake of blackness. How can casting the eponymous couple as an interracial pairing produce a story that is not immediately read as remarking on America's violent history of anti-miscegenation laws and lynching? Just as the unthought unspoken African presence gets distorted by literature and the construction of whiteness, the hyper visible blackness present on the stage distorts the narrative construction of white literature. But just as blackness distorts the narrative, so does whiteness, at least as we understand and perform it when we perform the text. Yet the other bodies, those unmarked by violence and slavery and unremarkable to epistemology, have the capacity to transmute the boundaries of national, religious, and blood identity that define Shakespeare's characters in the text. I marvel at the capacity of these white bodies to remain unremarkable and in the process enforce unspoken rules of order that dislocate history and disorder time. I marvel at how their whiteness is constructed in relation to the Africanist presence within a quote, wholly racialized society in which there is no escape from racially inflicted language and how their being, their white being, constructed in relation to a racially inflicted being created in the whole of the ship escapes linguistic racialization. When the cast list is posted, my suspicions are confirmed. While national, religious, cultural, cultural, and familial differences all get alighted and assumed by contemporary notions of universalizing whiteness, the insertion of black flesh into the story remains unthinkable. I look at these white bodies listed in black on white paper, and I cannot help but wonder how unremarkable whiteness imposes itself on both history and memory, recreating the present and past in its own image. I chuckled at the myopia. The perpetrators of this resistance qua violence often fail to recognize the irony of their own positions, the pot calling the kettle black, pun intended. 
just like with the 1995 film version of Othello starring the Black Lawrence Fishburne opposite the French Swiss Irene Jacob as Desdemona, the Irish Kenneth Branagh as Iago, the Welsh, Welsh Michael Sheen as Lodovico, and the English Indra Ove as Bianca. Differences that mattered in Shakespeare's England are obstructed by white-lined walls. Again, white flesh will compose the entirety of the visual grammar of the stage, and just as much as it composes the whole of the story, it remains unremarkable. Literally, I cannot express linguistically the assumptions that intersect in the timelessness of humanity and subjectivity inherent in the narrative of whiteness. Our current conceptions of whiteness have whitewashed not only the stage, but also our memories of a time when humanity and whiteness existed, existed as independent and antagonistic entities. I cannot help but question the wholesale application of normative white subjectivity in the works of William Shakespeare and the effect it has on our continued reading and performing of his works. For the most part, scholars and practitioners alike take for granted the assumption that whiteness and Englishness are inextricab inextricably linked at the first ontological instance, relying on Aaron and Othello to bear the full burden of Shakespeare's racial discourse. But as we often assume, uh, but as we assume so often that we do not have to speak it, the English were not always white, at least not in any sense with which we would recognize whiteness today. The process of creating whiteness by positioning it in relation to the Africanist qua blackness presence in literature as explored by Toni Morrison is not limited to the literary imagination. The process of white world making that occurs in American literature has an analog in early modern England. The Africanist presence can be unpacked and analyzed through the manipulation of early modern scientific discourse to remake the white body as the normative human subject in relation to black flesh. To dislodge our current conceptions of whiteness from the at best ambivalent and at worst apathetic role of whiteness in early modern English world making requires a deep investigation not only of modern and historical white world making, but of white flesh making in Renaissance England. This is not to say that the early modern English did not think themselves white, but rather to question how the early modern English subject came to integrate whiteness into its corporeality. For the most part, when whiteness appears as the center point of a discourse of difference, we often accept the world as it is, with whiteness as inextricable from coherent corporeal humanity, rather than questioning how that world came to be. This is the pathology of white life. The assumption of the human is always already corporeal, com corporeally composed of white flesh and never being other than. But white flesh has not always been a determiner of human subjectivity. One aspect in which this can be unpacked is through humoral theory. Mary Floyd Wilson argues that geohumoral theory, quote, regionally inflected humoralism reductively construed as climate theory by modern scholars proves to be the dominant mode of ethnic, ethnic distinctions in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. But the humoral theory from which geohumoral derives has a history that predates English Renaissance by nearly two millennia. First laid out in the Hippocratic corpus, dubiously attributed to Polybus titled On the Nature of Man, humoral theory posits that all living matter is composed of four basic fluids, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile, with each fluid linked to a season, an element, a direction, a quality, and a temperament. But even medical literature engages with slippages that elide historical distinctions from modern epistemologies. While black bile, yellow bile, white limb, and red blood have entered into academic parlance of humoral theory and its offspring geohumoral theory, in the original treatise, color is literally not so black and white. According to rheumatologist Irving Kushner, the Hippocratic school felt that the yellow layer at the top represented bile and named it accordingly. The Greek for bile is kole. Next, the dirty gray component resembled mucus, phlegm, which was associated with inflammation. Next, a red layer, obviously the color of blood and so named ultimately in Latin, sanguis. Finally, a darker reddish layer, which they took to be black bile, melancholia. Noticeably absent from the Greek text describing the separation of blood into its form elements is the linkage between whiteness and phlegm that is prevalent in early modern English discourse. Instead, Blackness existed as part of the constitution of all flesh. Humoral theory remained absent whiteness as it reached the Middle East through the works of Avicenna in the 11th century and into Italian medicine in the 14th century. 
So with over a millennium of humoral theory existing without whiteness, how do the English become white, both in their own historical discourse and in our present memories? While all flesh under humoral theory was partially composed of black bile, white flesh is constituted as a constituted subject only gains paradigmatic coherence in relation to the visually coherent black flesh. Prior to the encounter with black African flesh, white flesh signaled the absence of blood, the separation of flesh from the source of life, and thus white flesh signaled death. To begin with the geohumoral, as Harrison did in 1587 and as Floyd Wilson did in 2003, is to already misremember the past. As the phrase itself indicates, geohumoral attaches a prefix onto the already centuries old medical discourse of humoral theory. And with the prefix comes the baggage of racial thought. The regional inflections onto humorism are, as, Mary, as Floyd Wilson conveniently leaves out, racial inflections that position whiteness on the human side of the white black binary. The Africanist presence, although largely fabricated, was already present in the ideations of Africa and blackness that the geo brought into humoralism. As I argued in Anti-Black Racism and Early Modern English Drama, The Other Other, varying semiotic discourses converged to present the beings that inhabit the interior of Africa, those with the darkest skin who would serve as the basis for Harrison's comparisons with the suddenly white British as ungodly, inhuman, and absolute abject. In light of this history, geo must not only be read as a discourse of nation and space, but also as a discourse of race and difference. When that fateful prefix of geo entered into humoral discourse, it brought along with it discourses on blackness that were already burdened with religious notions of racial difference that were predicated on white black binaries and cultural discourses of African that were burdened with imaginings of monstrosity and inhumanity. When the African presence, Africanist presence ceases to exist purely in the abstract and becomes corporeally present, the visual observations of the internal were rewritten under the auspices of the visual signifiers of the external, and thus white flesh was brought to life and became inextricable from human flesh, giving life to whiteness in relation to black Africanist paradigmatic absence. The white flesh then is not a matter of scientific observation, but rather a matter of discursive imposition a remaking of scientific knowledge to center whiteness as, as a desired quality of humanity. And so we in the present forget the historical links between white flesh and absence and in turn remember, bring, into, bring the past into present awareness and remember, make the body whole, dismembered white flesh as always already. This is the paradox of the world made in the image of whiteness. Those whose humanity is unburdened and unqualified by racial signifiers are able to rewrite history in a way that allows them to be simultaneously so unique as to be recognized as individual humans, yet so homogenous that their various identities are subsumed by the overwhelming power of whiteness. In our modern day, the memories of white permanence and the act of whitewashing of the various identities that compose this whiteness cause us to misremember the ways in which Shakespeare articulates identity and subjectivity throughout his works. And assuming whiteness is the primary constructor of identity in Shakespeare's plays, we misremember and misread the past, reconstructing history to fit into our present. Thinking beyond the present moment and with this new understanding of Shakespeare's whiteness, I return once more to the cast list and I am perplexed. I am perplexed as to how we allow anachronistic assumptions of white corporeal coherence to give opportunities to the white students for whom the entirety of the academy is designed to function while using bad faith interpretations of the same theories to deny opportunities to non-white students. By interpreting our modern human whiteness in this, as the same as Shakespeare's whiteness, we erase important distinctions between peoples to fit the performances into a modern paradigm of anti-Black violence. Looking again, the cast list appears in double. One eye sees the immense diversity of identities that govern difference in Shakespeare's England, English, German, Italian, and Irish, and Catholics and Protestants and agnostics. The other eye sees only the modern governor of absolute difference, the veil of unifying white flesh that formed in binary opposition to and at the expense of abject and inhuman black flesh. Thank you. When the word cosmetic first appears in an original English text, it's identified as one of the four types of knowledge needed to regulate what Francis Bacon in his humanistic The Advancement of Learning in 1605 calls, quote unquote, the good of a man's body. 
If cosmetics was a category of knowledge for Bacon, it was categorically the antithesis of knowledge for Ben Johnson, who invade against it with his misogynistic humanism, as he does with the character True Wit in his Epicene or the Silent Woman from 1609, where he satirizes cosmetic meetings where, quote, ladies that call themselves collegiates crying down or up what they like or dislike in a brain or a fashion with most masculine or rather hermaphroditical authority and every day gain to their college some new probationer, end of quote. Johnson aimed his most serious attack on cosmetics at what he saw, however, as a skewing of white racial knowledge and ontology. He stages this diatribe in The Mask of Blackness from 1605, the same year as Bacon's Advancement of Learning, where he tries to position his text and its deliberately erudite marginalia against the body of Queen Anne, the queen consort, who presumably, as a challenge to King James's masculine authority, commissioned the mask and created its black conceit. Pacey Stephen Orgo, the mask of blackness did have an audience of one, but it wasn't James, it was Anne. Johnson turned his umbrage at Anne's audacious demand to appear in blackface into a battle between what he understood to be Anne's feminine cosmetics and his masculine erudite humanist learning, her black paint and his white making ink. For Johnson, Anne and her clatch of ladies were very much like the hermaphroditic women of those infamous cosmetic meetings, mistaking women's work, uh, I'm sorry, mistaking women's play for men's work. Such a delusion from Johnson's perspective leads the Danish Queen Anne and her ladies to perform in the English court as a troop of lean cheeked Moors. Quote, By Donnie Black, the cosmetics and tries, I am arguing, to upstage the highly cosmeticized cult of whiteness that had been so ostentatiously the face, so to speak, of the English court up until the death of Elizabeth in 1603. Johnson wanted to insist, however, that Anne and her ladies were less queen in royal courtage or even lean cheek moors than they were a troop of rude mechanicals playing outside their social, political, and racial depths who, says Shakespeare's Philostrata about the latter, never labored in their minds till now. The connection I'm making here is neither whimsical nor a rhetorical flourish. The argument I will make in the second half of this presentation is that Johnson turns in the latter part of his mask to the final scene of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, which captures for Johnson, I will argue, the dream of a racial whiteness that had only been captured appreciatively by Shakespeare, whom Johnson would eulogize later as both the father and exemplar of the English race, that swan of Avon, that swan of Avion. For Johnson, it's England that would make Anne truly white, not the other way around. England, this land whose beam shines day and night, quoting Johnson, and are a force to blanch an Ethiop and revive a corpse, can solve the rude defects of every creature, end of quote. As Johnson insists in The Mask of Beauty from 1608, a year before Epicene, it's English whiteness, quote, to whose having every clime laid claim, each land and nation urged as the aim now made peculiar to this place alone. True whiteness, however, much other true whiteness, however much others may try to imitate it, belongs to England alone. And while aristocratic English women may be the most favorable ambassadors for English whiteness, Johnson's mask is something of an ambassadorial event. This fact, Johnson suggests, should not confuse the fact that whiteness is fundamentally, that is naturally, a masculine and British property with deep roots in both history and the classics. In some of the first spoken words in Johnson's Mask, the white Bosiena says to the Black Niger, quote, my ceaseless current now amazed it stands to see thy labor through so many lands, end of quote. Johnson's real audience here is, in any case, is Anne, towards whom he most dispassionately directs his racial impatience and animus and his lexical misogyny. Johnson wants to know why Anne has worked so hard, labored through so many lands, that is, in order to, quote, mix her fresh billow with England's and Johnson's brackish stream, and in her sweetness, continuing to quote Johnson, stretched her diadem to these far distant and unequal skies. 
and like the black ladies of her conceit, Johnson insists, has also traveled through a colorized geography. In Anne's case, one taking her from the pallid whiteness of Denmark to the more robust whiteness of Britain in general to the incomparable whiteness of England in particular. What Anne's conceit reveals, argues Johnson, is that Denmark is constitutionally, racially that is, much farther from England than it may geographically appear. Denmark may be Western, but it's England alone that can boast it occupies the place of, quote unquote, extremist West. Misogynistically, Johnson's labor also alludes to Anne's sexual and pederational labor, echoing Shakespeare's Puck, who, quote, sometimes labored in the kern and bootless make the breathless housewife churn. In Johnson's estimate, Anne, six months pregnant with her sixth child, but her first child who would be born in England, uh, had already given birth to potentates who were already holding much sway and would further propagate through so many lands, that is, uh, England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. She has worked hard, pitiably, to mix with British stock, only to produce, uh, Johnson argues, a race of changelings. Johnson, sounding like many of the early modern humanist texts, takes solace in the view, quote, that since the immortal souls of creatures mortal mix with their bodies, yet reserve forever a power of separation. While Johnson seems to offer here a bit of sententia of bodies mixing with their souls during the time the latter resides here on earth, more pointedly, he's insisting that the mixing of bodies should not be construed as the mixing of essences. England's whiteness cannot be corrupted. Neptune's son, Albion the Fair, hasn't just ruled England since the Kalian days, but continues to rule it. It is his crown, that snowy cliff that sits confidently above the ocean's waves. What Anne fails to realize, argues Johnson, is that no matter how proudly James or anyone else may wear a temporary English crown or however much she, Anne, may stretch her diadem, England's whiteness is supra-temporal and is literally built into England's petrological substratum rising majestically from the ocean's floor. Johnson weaponizes humanism as a cultural, political, and aesthetic strategy for not just representing, but fortifying and securing white world and white people making, and poses his triumphant humanist masculine labor against what he sees as Anne's futile cosmetic feminine labor. Yes, says Johnson, my ceaseless current now amazes stands. For the moment, you have stopped the unending flow of my writing with your cosmetic labor, which Johnson satirizes as Anne's Herculean labor. You've given us something of a showstopper, but something causing at best only a temporary pause. Johnson speaks exactly to this point when in the mask first book in words, be silent now, uh, be silent now the ceremony's done essentially telling Anne she's had her say, her disruption, and it's time for her to be quiet and for Johnson to move beyond the niceties of ceremony. As directed at Anne, Johnson accuses her of trying to mix thy fresh billow with my brackish stream. His line gets to the core of his racial misogyny or his misogynistic racism as he duels with Anne, who has presumed with her cosmetic ruse to bestow upon herself a kind of hermaphroditic authority. He positions his white producing phallic pen against Anne's faux masculine and faux racial, therefore more amusing than threatening fresh billow, alluding here, I suggest, to a bill, a 16th and 17th century spearheaded weapon with a very phallic looking hilt that often, that often appears with the word bow. More significantly, bills were most famous for being painted and went by their color's name, with black bills being the most popular. In short, so to speak, Johnson continues his mockery here of a hermaphroditic Anne, argues Johnson, a pseudo white and phallically male equipped Anne is simply ill prepared to do battle with him in England. However much she may think she has weaponized her show stopping black cosmetic stunt. Johnson figures a Midsummer Night's Dream as less oniric than as a testament to an English culture whose whiteness is both historically and ontologically real. 
Hippolyta and Theseus open the final scene of Shakespeare's play, speaking of the strange mixing of natural and supernatural forces that have been at work throughout it. Divine Oceanus, says Johnson's Niger in his opening words, tis not strange at all, that is, given the power of separation that in the end guarantees to keep souls and bodies from mixing and in their proper cosmological place. However much creative or delusional libertines may subject hell, quote, in earth, quote, to kinetic imaginings, a point made by Shakespeare's Theseus, uh, for example, Johnson's Niger insists and responds, virtue, though chained to earth, will still live free, and hell itself must yield to industry. Notwithstanding, the two texts do sometimes collude, as when Theseus' dismissal of the antique fables of the seething brains of the lunatic, the lover, and the poet, for example, allies with Niger's indictment of, quote, the fabulous voices of some few poor brain sick men style poets. And Niger's response to Theseus is less contravention than emulation, especially when it comes to Johnson's use of Shakespeare's text to push back against and chastise Anne. Theseus asks, what mask, what music, how shall we beguile the lazy time if not with some delight? First, he refuses to hear the battle with the centaurs to be sung by an Athenian eunuch, a kind of hermaphroditic figure for Johnson's purposes. Besides, says Theseus, it's a story he himself has told of my kinsman, Hercules. His filiation further dissociates Anne from what Johnson mocks as her pitiable Herculean labors. Theseus continues his Johnsonian insist when he next rejects the riot of the tipsy Bacchanals, tearing the Thracian singer in their rage. Likening Anne and her ladies to these riotous drunken women, dismembering and castrating this principal poet. Besides, says Theseus, it's an old device, and it was played when I from Thebes came last a conqueror, a fact and rhetorical move meant to outman these women who naively mix and confuse feminine and ceremonial conquest with the real decimating power of masculine warfare. While, quote, their beauties may conquer in great beauty's war, quoting Johnson, for Johnson, Anne has naively chosen to go to war, not in some cosmetically inspired woman's clutch, but in the masculine sphere of the court. After this second rejection, Theseus and Johnson go their separate ways. That is, for his nuptials, Theseus chooses a fourth option, a tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love, Thisbe, very tragical mirth, that leaves Philostrata crying with, quote unquote, merry tears. Given Johnson digs at Anne, a scene of the undying love between Pyramus and Thisbe would have seemed nothing if not hypocritical, given the famously discordant and infelicitous marriage between Anne and James. While Theseus may ask about the tedious brief play, how shall we find the concord of this discord, Johnson, who has no desire to do anything for Anne beyond being dutifully ceremonially respectful, would have no interest in seeing Anne as anything other than the source of discord in herself and as a disruption of British and English white purity and superiority, a temporal disruption in English history and stock in England's classical inheritance. Johnson chooses the third option, at least some version of it. One Theseus says doesn't quote, sort with a nuptial ceremony. That is the thrice three muses mourning for the death of learning late deceased in beggary. It is says Theseus, some satire keen and critical. Johnson means serious business. For him, there is nothing romantic or comedic about the Danish Anne's marriage to the Scottish James or her coming to the English throne. It is in fact a matter of some exigency. Philostrate's merry tears sit in, contradic in contradistinction to Niger's daughters who says Niger, quote, wept ceaseless tears into my stream ceaseless or ceaseless, because in the real world, their blackness will forever leave them alienated from whiteness and leave their tears inconsequential. As far as concerns Anne, Johnson essentially derides her, accuses her of whining and crying as he strategically positions her feminine tears against the masculine brackish stream with all the attendant implications lying therein. 
Johnson brings with him not just the light of humanist learning, but also the weaponizing of Englishness itself, arguing that like Shakespeare's unschooled and melopropic rude mechanicals, Anne has not been forced to labor in her mind till now. Anne's ceaseless tears stand in contrast to Johnson's ceaseless current, and he finds her dramaturgical and tear-filled labor to be nothing if not tedious. When Johnson accuses Anne of weeping ceaseless tears into his stream, he plays too on the homophonic relationship between tears and terrors that is ripping, criticizing Anne's efforts to lacerate not only his writing, his artistry and vision, but the English body itself, like the tipsy bacchanals tearing the Thracian singer spoken of by, Theseus, uh, by Shakespeare's Theseus, Johnson effectively accuses her of overflowing his shore, ceaselessly crying and overstepping, and therefore forcing him to respond with all his sexual and racial artillery. He worries not, however, he brags, because he sees Anne as having grossly misread the depths and profundity of English whiteness. He fervently underscores when he turns to cosmeticized whiteness and to what I would argue is the raison d'etre of his text and his homage to an emulation of Shakespeare's. In Johnson, the fabulous voice, quoting Johnson, the fabulous voice of some few poor brain sick men style poets here with you have with such envy of their grace song, the painted beauties other empire sprung, letting their loose and winged fictions fly to infect all climates, yea, all purity. Uh, to read that quickly again, the fabulous voices of some few poor brain sick men style poets here with you have with some envy of their grace, sung the painted beauties other empires sprung, letting their loose and winged fictions fly to infect all climates, yea, our purity. In Shakespeare's such loose and mad poeticizing leads to one seeing, quote, Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt, the black woman being cosmeticized into a white one. Anne is Johnson's real audience here, along with a host of misguided English poets, and not simply because he can make the now familiar argument that she is the Egyptian, the Ethiopian Johnson, who is attempting to be made over into fairness. Expectantly, no pun intended, Anne has misconstrued the inimitable nature of English whiteness because she, in fact, doesn't possess it and is at best only able to emulate with her best cosmetic laborious stunt, the painted beauties, like Helen say, that other empires sprung. For Johnson, the joke is on Anne. Not only will her big reveal in the mask of beauty expose her emulation of nothing but a cosmeticized whiteness, it will also expose the difference between other empires fetishization of whiteness and the real thing, which is only to be found in England. She confuses Elizabeth's cosmeticized outward whiteness with Elizabeth's inner white essence. Such cosmeticizing is the bane of racial others. John Bulwer will argue later in his Anthropometamorphosis, Man Transformed or the Artificial Changeling, 1653, that cosmeticizing is, quote, the artificial device through which the Moors, once white, might, by the infection of their seed, possibly, quote unquote, become Negroes. And obviously suffers from the infection of non-whiteness. All cosmetics can do, all it has done, is mask the majestic perfection of English whiteness. If Anne were white in her mind, say, argues the humanist Johnson, she would have known better. Perhaps in anticipation of the pregnant Anne giving birth to a son, to yet another palate changeling, she would actually give birth to a daughter. The last words one hears in the mask, and shout with joy of favor you have won in sight of Avion, Neptune's son. End Johnson, these words end Johnson's mask with him claiming victory over Anne, 
who has only been extended a ceremonious favor, both in Johnson's mask and in her being allowed, even as consort, to sit on England's throne. No matter how many sons she gives birth to and how many sons she spreads across Britain, England's white rock and white racial stock cannot, will not be disrupted. Britain, and needs to be taught, is the divine earthly home of white people, and England is is ever reproducing and ever protecting brackish oceanic source. The blessed nativity that anticipates the birth of children born without blots or scars that ends Shakespeare's play not only provides Johnson with his dreamlike source, but anticipates Johnson's timeless, that is, proleptic reading and eulogizing of Shakespeare as the true primogenitor of English whiteness. As cosmetics, like her tears, have come to naught. All she has been able to do, according to Johnson, is put on an indecent display of her white fragility, a tedious defense of an embarrassingly pallid pathos. However sincere or well-meaning the presumption of shedding white women's tears is, it remains, as Robin DiAngelo has repeatedly noted, one of, quoting her, one of the most pernicious enactments of white fragility, end of quote. Johnson doesn't fall for it. Beyond the scope of this particular essay, but not beyond the early modern critical race studies, the early modern critical race studies politics that inform it, learning to read whiteness in Johnson and in Johnson's reading of Shakespeare provides us with a way of bettering our humanist labor by asking how the very threat of white women's tears within the critical arena of Shakespeare's, of Shakespeare's studies shape and police what we others are allowed or what we allow ourselves to see and say. White women's tears, along with white men's rage, even though that's not the subject of this particular essay, white women's tears have a way of surreptitiously taking control of the narrative. They are a poor imitation, literally a simulacrum, a bad reading for Johnson of white women's iconic place in England's not to be disrupted or corrupted whiteness. In Johnson's cosmology, white women's tears are only symptomatic of those loose winged fictions, those racial infections that can't disrupt England or Shakespeare's whiteness, but whose histrionics one must always be ready, even vigilant, about calling out and defending against. In Johnson's cosmology, there is no need for white women's ceaseless tears. After all, real white women don't cry. Not even in our world, where the fictional tears of so many white women have led to streams of real blood from far too many of Niger's black sons. Thank you. No exeunt, the urgent work of critical whiteness. I am a white person in Shakespeare. That is, I am a white scholar in the field of Shakespeare studies. I have not always thought of myself as white, Consciousness of my white identity and of the unearned privilege that goes with it has been a gradual development over the course of my life. I am now at the end of my career and I am seizing this moment to tell you how I got here and what I think is the opportunity for our field in close reading of Shakespeare through the lens of racial whiteness. As an Amherst College student, I engaged in civil rights activism in Raleigh, North Carolina and Greenville, Mississippi. After receiving my BA in 1967, I left immediately for Birmingham, England to study with the Jamaican born British cultural theorist, Stuart Hall, before being called up for the draft and having to pause my graduate work. The experience that would forever leave its mark on me took place from 1969 to 1970 during the Vietnam War when I performed two years of alternate service as a conscientious objector in Haiti as the manager of the pharmacy 
at the Hôpital Albert Schweitzer in a remote area of the country, I began to register the deep effects of what it meant to live as a white racial minority for a sustained period. Under the regime of dictator Papa Doc Duvalier and his paramilitary group, the Tonton Makut, I was not protected by my whiteness. Yet when I resumed graduate school, the learning curve sparked by this formative experience in Haiti went underground. I was not yet able to apply it to my academic life. Not until I went head to head with senior faculty in the English department at Williams College, my first academic appointment, did I begin merging my two years in Haiti with my teaching by disrupting the literary canon that formed the curriculum. Conversations with the black writer, Melvin Dixon, a close faculty friend, gave me the courage to rebel. We discussed the absence of women, black and queer writers and the lengths to which the academic establishment would go to protect the status quo. My encounter with Alice Walker's work in the late 1970s and the poetry and essays of Adrian Rich helped me to find my voice as did ongoing dialogues with writers, including the black poet, June Jordan, and scholars such as Jean Howard, who introduced me to Kim Hall. Because of their supportive companionship, I found my ways to others equally committed to literary criticism as social justice activism. As my Shakespeare scholarship continued to evolve, I also expanded my son study of contemporary black and feminist writers and later black visual artists and the images of blacks in Western art. Engaging with this broad range of creative production I increasingly understood that I could not speak of racial whiteness unless I could speak with deeper awareness of my own ideological formation. I realized I could not separate myself as a white person from my work as a white scholar. My theoretical framework was built on the principle of transformation, changing the conventions by which we understand and organize canons and a willingness to shake the deepest foundations of my white identity. Only then would I be able to see dimensions of Shakespeare's work that would otherwise have eluded me. More significantly is what this taught me about whiteness as a way of being from which I can never be distanced and cannot hide. In close re reading, the text and I, as a white person, intersect and create meaning with and for one another. They not only collide but also challenge and stimulate each other. How can I, as a white scholar, occupy a site in which this shared whiteness of Shakespeare, his characters, and myself be differentiated? And how can these distinctions become a source of tension and insight. What does it mean 
to read Shakespeare through the lens of racial whiteness. First, I must resist the reflex that causes me automatically to translate race as black or as of color, meaning everything except white. There must be a tacit acknowledgement of whiteness, including my own, as a distinct racial category. Second, I am a white person in Shakespeare, but I am also a white person outside of Shakespeare, adopting a sharply critical, indeed self-critical stance. I must remain aware of negotiating and simultaneously per pers pursuing both stands of this dual identity. My inside outside position creates a productive frisson. My critical apparatus must be informed by an ethos of self-awareness. Third, I accept the value and validity of the cross historical that the past and the present intersect in literary criticism as they do in life. Sitting in a theater watching one of Shakespeare's plays makes this abundantly clear. For the duration of a performance, I am conscious of living in two worlds. I puzzle over their divergence and the impossibility of seamless continuity or neat synthesis, despite claims that Shakespeare represents timeless values. Having a much longer historical timeline for race studies does not mean collapsing and merging all the points along the line as though they are the same. Rather, it means connecting the dots, each of which simultaneously retains its own separate and distinct integrity. The fiction of Shakespeare's permanent unvarying universality is contradicted by this condition of historical differentiation. Shakespeare is neither historically transcendent nor fixed in time. He is subject to the change in issues that concern me as a contemporary person and the values that guide my work. Fourth, my relationship with Shakespeare's whiteness is mediated by his characters. I must be open to the myriad and complex ways in which his characters express and reveal their whiteness. Shakespeare's characters do not articulate racial whiteness directly. Actions may sometimes speak louder than words. Portia doesn't have to say she's white. Her good riddance for the, to the Prince of Morocco, let all of his complexion choose me so, exhibits her whiteness without a, the word. White behavior is never totally silent and nonverbal, but rather indirect and thus potentially available for decoding. Even when the implied white entitlement is not spelled out, Shakespearean actions still speak loudly. Whiteness is performed in behavior and gestures. Although the discourse of racial difference is unquestionably present, 
it can be difficult to discern the precise nature of white characters' evasive attitudes toward that discourse. As in the contemporary world, we may encounter in individuals a complete lack of self-awareness of their racism and an absence of any fully articulated sense of shame or embarrassment. Instead, we find we face an elusive or subterranean entitlement whose implied presence permits and invites analyses. These strategies are particularly manifest in Shakespeare's dramatic engagements with cross-racial interactions. In close reading through the lens of racial whiteness, we find abundant evidence in the voices of Shakespeare's characters to counter claims that we are imposing the present on Shakespeare in ways which are a historical or that race is not relevant. Even a few detailed analyses of the relationship between blackness and whiteness contradict such claims. We see it and we hear it in Shakespeare's language. The dynamics of this relationship are exact and acted explicitly and even more often implicitly. It is hidden within his characters defining how they see and experience one another and their world. For over 40 years, my project in performing close readings of Shakespeare's work has been to demonstrate the necessity of using critical race studies to peel back the layers of Shakespeare's whiteness and our own. I do not separate this strategy of literary criticism from the equally urgent work of anti-racism from which there is no exeunt. As I take leave of this field, I implore my white colleagues to continue advancing racial equality by ensuring that critical whiteness studies are essential to early modern race studies. I also ask them to listen and to learn from our colleagues of color invested in this work and to be cognizant of how we hide behind our white fragility as a tactic for avoiding change. As public intellectuals and as educators, we must write, teach, and think with intention to provide our students with a model upon which they can reflect about what is at stake for them in their education and what is at stake in their lives. Let us show them that there are no intellectual havens from the real world. Our critical apparatus does not, cannot stand apart. Reading Shakespeare through the lens of racial whiteness has taught me so much about where we are now, how we got here and where we go next. To be anti-racist, as a Shakespeare scholar is to be awake to the formation of discourses that have aided and abetted a system 
that suppresses diverse interpretation and consequently who we choose to see, who is heard, whose voices and perspectives are valued. It has determined what we teach, whose careers and ideas are advanced, how the bard's plays are performed and by whom. In short, whose Shakespeare rules. The Academy is called the ivory tower for a reason. It is white. If we are not to be a slave to our whiteness, we must start with an acknowledgement of how it shaped Shakespeare and how it shapes us. Thank you very much uh, to, to our four panelists for fantastic uh, papers with some, I think, truly provocative intersections. Um, I, I'm, we're opening up here the chat to the large group of attendees. If you want to drop questions into the chat, now is the time. And we do have some time here to, uh, for, for our panelists to answer some questions. Uh, but yeah, first and foremost, the congratulations are coming in. And yes, I, I have to agree with Ayana saying amazing, uh, truly, truly amazing work that you all uh, brought to the table. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, if, you, if you all have questions, please drop them in there and, and I'll try to sort through them. and from there. I guess as we're waiting here for, for a question to come in and, and people to formulate their ideas, I, I, I was curious here, and I, I'll take this opportunity and, and, and run with it actually, uh, but thinking about the, the, the bookends to this, this conversation, uh, Arthur, with you thinking about uh, white women's tears here, right, and Kate, as you came to Antony's tears here, right, and what a white man's tears indicate in, in terms of purification, right, working at opposite ends, I wonder if, if you all can put uh, these ideas in conversation with each other. Uh, Arthur, I know you juxtapose white women's tears with, with, with uh, white male rage, right, uh, in, in some ways. But in thinking about the opposite, Arthur, have you given, given thought to this? And, and Kate, conversely, also, you know, thinking about uh, white women in antiquity, uh, you know, in, in this regard. So perhaps, perhaps something, something there. Well, I will, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I will mostly leave this up to uh, to Kate, uh, but I would say that the um, in part when I was thinking about white men's rage, I was actually thinking of your paper for your your, your article, uh, Ruben, for white people in Shakespeare. Uh, that's on on uh, white anger, so that was in part where uh, some of my ideas were coming from. I was very intrigued. Um, by Kate's paper and thinking about uh, the tears of white men. And, and perhaps it's a bit of a predictable response for me, but what, I, what comes to mind most immediately for me is the way in which white men tears pick back up on a lot of the same logics as white women's tears. And that's not to insist that men can't cry and, and, and I get uh, regendered in, in, in any kind of formulation, but that it does strike me that part of, of what, for example, is happening in Julius Caesar is a, a lot of kind of code switching around gender and uh, taking account of case paper and around race. So um, yes, but I, I was struck about that uh, struck by that as well. Yeah, so first of all, I would say that I'm fascinated by Arthur's whole reading of Ben Johnson and the way that he figures masculinity as the site of um, whiteness and the way that kind of fits into this whole like Jacobean court kind of, you know, culture and a sort of shift from whiteness being Elizabeth to whiteness as somehow, I don't know, James or something. But um, because I, I guess there's so much counter discourse in which whiteness is most clearly signified by the white female body, um, you know, as, as Kim Hall has argued. And so I'm interested, I agree, I think with what Arthur was saying, I think the tears in Julius Caesar are sort of 
of figured as feminine and it's sort of all working out through this like feminized Christian discourse around Christ's body. Um, and so there is that sense of like the the sacrifice that you have in say the Lucretia myth or other like when you think about like the tears and the blood and all of that from the sacrificed woman is somehow all like transmitted onto or transferred onto Caesar and so somehow there is a, a feminized um, kind of pathos I think that um, is inspired you know in the Romans in Julius Caesar. So I guess I'm like really interested in thinking more about that intersection of like white tears, white feminized tears as like doing a really sort of effective work, but then also how the kind of more like white masculine um, sort of um, misogynistic rejection of that is also doing a different kind of white work. And so how those kind of intersect is super interesting to me. Yeah, and I, I would just add one quick comment to that as well. And that's what I see happening. And I don't want to repeat it because uh, you, you've all heard it, but that's what I see happening in uh, ben Johnson's Mask of Blackness as well is, is this, and it's some other works of his as well, is this, his being kind of tortured by the efficacy of the, of the white woman's body. I think mean, he's very conscious of its kind of emblematic power, but at the same time, beyond that emblematic power, isn't that interested in that female body, right? That, that what he really wants to do is sort of talk about the, the masculine state or talk about the state as masculine and how it is says to sort of both use and marginalize the, the white female body it seems to me a part of the ongoing project that you see in some of Johnson's work. Thank you both. Uh, we have a, a few questions coming in here. I, I'm going to highlight here Celine Khoury's question about teaching because it was something that I was interested in. And, and as you know, I, I thought about this panel in particular, I'm recognizing uh, the regional differences in terms of the institutions and institutional differences, quite frankly, uh, at which you teach. And so uh, her question is uh, about, about teaching um, these plays in the classroom with critical lens. What has that experience been like? Uh, and, and, and thanking you for the amazing papers. And I, I was struck by this, by what you know, Peter suggested, right? Where, where he says, you know, in terms of cross historical work, which you all seem to be engaging in uh, meaningfully, right? The past and present intersect not only in literary criticism, but as they do in life as well here, right? How have your students uh, been, uh, have they been responsive to these particular issues? Has there been resistance? And if so, how do you navigate those particular areas? And, and, and wanting to highlight here, you know, specifically Peter and, and Matt, if, if possible in terms of thinking about this because of the kind of personal um, um, anecdotes that, that were included there. Um, I mean, I, I'm happy to start. Uh, one thing that, that I've taken to doing um, in, my, in my classrooms is I won't teach a Shakespeare play unless I can find a, a contemporary adaptation by a historically unrepresented person to pair alongside it. Um, so I won't teach Othello without teaching Toni Morrison's Desdemona with it. Um, I won't teach uh, Henry IV Part I without teaching Herbert Seguenza's El Henry with it. And part of it is when we have courses, right, we, we look through a curriculum and Shakespeare is the only, in a lot of universities, a lot of schools, Shakespeare is the only author who has a course um, that's part of the regular curriculum solely devoted to him. And when Shakespeare is so attached to um, whiteness, imperialism, uh, cultural capital, all of these types of things, as someone coming to this from theater, you know, I was told in undergrad as a, you know, 20 year old black American male that if I wanted to teach or act in this country, I needed to be able to do Shakespeare. And that's because more than half of the plays done in this country are still Shakespeare. Um, it's the only thing that's taught across the curriculum. And my thought is why? Um, and as I got older, I started to think, was this universal advice or was this you? You, a six foot five black man, if you want to teach, if you want to act, you have to prove that you are safe. Um, to the white institutions where you'll be teaching and acting. Um, so I did that. 
And now that I'm in those institutions, uh, like I said, I don't teach Shakespeare without putting it in conversation with a contemporary voice um, that he either A, didn't have historically the capacity to consider, or B, would have considered in some way um, that the university apparatus as a whole continues to reinforce and inflict violently on um, non-white, non-male, non-cisgendered students. Well, I could add to that that um, I am using visual art and the example of that would be Fred Wilson, just to give one example. This is part of the discussion in my class. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I, I mean, I've read your work on this and it's, it's, it's um, I mean, really inspiring in this way in, in terms of thinking about this. I, maybe uh, this dovetails with it, but Elisa O uh, presents a, a question here. Uh, she writes, each rigorous paper will require much processing. Thank you all. I wonder whether any of the panelists would care to speak about new critical vocabularies that are growing up around whiteness studies and what kinds of vocabularies we still need to develop. Uh, this could include language for close readings, theorizing, describing, rendering shades of whiteness visible. I think uh, quite quite simply, um, well, not quite simply, right? It, it's, it's immense work. One of the things we do is, is um, or I believe we should start doing is start um, giving voice, giving sight to whiteness, start actually saying, you know, I uh, think American always comes with an unspoken whiteness, human comes with an unspoken whiteness. If you're reading a novel and the character is a white, uh, cisgendered, heterosexual male, that character escapes description. Everyone else gets identifiers. And we need to start making whiteness not the norm, but one amongst many. And I think one way we could do that is to simply start stating um, the gender and the race when the person is a white male. I, also, um, Peter, were you going to say? Well, I was just saying that it's uh, complicated uh, if there's a serious, um, discussion of whiteness and the critic um, is carrying that, which is what my situation is. And it is necessary um, to bring that out into the open. And uh, yes, there are white characters inside the play, but there's whiteness outside of the play. And that's where I am going uh, back and forward at the same time. And both of those sides need to be addressed and um, with, through poets um, and visual art and um, um, are surrounding all of this. And um, uh, we, um, those of us who are white individuals um, have to find ways to uh, express that and to be very clear about it and um, in a personal way. And that is what I have been trying to do. Um, and uh, uh, a critical uh, approach to uh, 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 whiteness. May I follow that? Yeah, of course. Um, sure. Yeah, and, and and I will follow. I I will add a a shameless plug for white people in Shakespeare. Uh, come out at the end of this year, we hope uh, that the that part of it, it, it is what Peter said. There there are two components to this. One is the the whiteness that's in Shakespeare. And two is the whiteness that is outside Shakespeare that is engaging with Shakespeare. And in terms of the, the first, it picks up too, I think on some of the points that uh, Matt was making. And it's that there isn't the, when one starts to look at Shakespeare through this uh, white critical lens, it's amazing to see how hard so many of these texts are working to sort of create a, 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 a this, this 
some sense of whiteness to, to find their, let's just say for easy sake for now, their white way. And it's not so much built around the, uh, the word race. And, and, and in part, that word and, and that concept in the way that we come at this really becomes debilitating because we sort of limit ourselves so often, or critics often do in our field, to sort of thinking about whiteness as, uh, or that when you're going to see it, it is strictly as I think you can see with Gary Taylor's work, for example, it has to be this racial category. And race is certainly a crucial component of thinking about whiteness or thinking about white people. But if you go to uh, Wahili's work that um, uh, Kate was quoting from, that it's one sort of has to think more broadly about processes or, or, of race, right? Think about racialization as opposed to race. And you go into these texts and you begin to discover how much whiteness is so much a part of the discourse, so much a part of these plays affect. And I think that one of the reasons that we don't see it or that we ignore it, it goes back to something that uh, Matt was saying, is because we've normalized it, because we, we, we look at it and we say, ah, here are the white people. And in part, what we are witnessing is we, we've taken the invention of white people, we've ended up at a particular place in the 21st century, and we like to look back and kind of just sort of see these, yeah. see this white wholeness that isn't, isn't there and it never was anywhere. But we sort of posit that back on the early modern period. And I think it picks up on points that a few people were raising. And I think this is one of the problems with our field and how white our field is. And I think it's something that white scholars have to, you know, when, when, when we in the rooms at SAA, if I could do anything, it would be to have white scholars when we're next all together in a big forum, a big ballroom to look around themselves. And because of this connection to the real world that Peter was talking about and to feel extremely uncomfortable about what is going, how they've ended up in such a white space. Uh, it's, it's not normal. If, if I may just sort of uh, pull out all the language here, but it, it, it's, it's something has happened to create a space that uh, I would venture to say, particularly in major uh, areas of study, that we've created this homogenous, nearly homogenous environment that we see nowhere else. How has, that has not, that is not an accident. And so, so thinking about both the whiteness at work inside the works and thinking about the work outside the work is crucial. And my mm -hmm. sense is to, to finish here, sorry for going on so much, uh, I start to get passionate here, but part of it is, I think the stakes are so high, and this picks up on uh, Peter's work and my admiration for Peter's work, is the stakes are so high, I think for the white, white people standing outside of Shakespeare's works that they, uh, you know, quote, unquote, they can't see or refuse to see the, the whiteness or the interrogations of whiteness that are going on in Shakespeare's works because they want that whiteness naturalized. And so when we appear at SAA, it all just seems like this kind of natural semiology between the plays, the works, the period, the Renaissance and the people who are in the room. And it's about time for white people at SAA to start to feel very uncomfortable and to feel as though they are complicitous uh, in something that at least in my uh, imagination and my hope that they do not want to be uh, complicitous in. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's fantastic. I, I would extend that discomfort hopefully to edited collections also, right? Uh, and and uh, the, the whiteness in, in many of those. Um, let me uh, try to, to synthesize some of these here. I, I think there are two questions here, one from Melissa and one from Karen uh, that, that are asking us to look beyond uh, critical race studies or whiteness studies here, right? Uh, you know, Melissa writes, uh, I've read some who argue that moving to post-human ideas of beings could help us to escape racial division. I disagree for several reasons. Do any of, of the panelists have a response to post-humanist approaches in regard to negotiation, negotiating race? And uh, then 
Karen, who we can kind of think, you can think about these two uh, together if you'd like here, right? But is wondering if the panelists have, uh, can comment on how their work and, and, and critical race uh, theory generally intersects with critical animal studies, right? As there were a lot of references to animals uh, within these papers, right? Uh, what are the discomforts, the interse intersections, the divergences in these two approaches? So if anybody wants to take the, the lead on this? No. Well, I mean, I can I can start broadly. I think I think there's a question. I mean, I don't think we really should be moving beyond critical race studies at this moment, um, given the weight of these questions, as um, Arthur and and um, Peter were just saying. I do think that race. I guess what I would say, and I think this is what I was sort of getting at somewhat with my critique of biopolitics, which is really what Healy's and um, critique, but. Um, is the idea that we um that these ideas right like so um all of these ideas like Dr. was saying like geohumoralism also you know ideas about post -human, um post-humanism biopolitics there are often moves to kind of like encapsulate race within this kind of broader system right but like race is so central to those to those frameworks that I think it's important to do that work. So I do think there are connections. I mean, I think thinking back to, you know, my paper and thinking about Coriolanus, there's certainly a lot to be said about the natural world, for example, in terms of the dehumanizing discourse that's used. Um, and so I think that that's definitely um, important. Um, but I also think like it's important to kind of like, like that we've paid more attention to the non-racial aspects of this, I think, than we have actually to the ways in which they're constitutive of whiteness in, per in particular, but also of other racial categories. And my quick add to that, is to uh, second everything that Kate was saying. And also that we are nowhere near ready to start talking about moving beyond. Um, the, and, and, and what I re recommend in that, again, going back to what Peter was saying, these are lifelong processes. These are, are, are you know, it is a, a there is a, a sense of a, this kind of naturalization of whiteness has been uh, so thorough in a sense so successful that many are probably even here today aren't really convinced that it needs to be interrogated. And um, I would suggest a good place to start for anyone who, who's asking that question uh, would be to go to philosopher Charles, Charles Mills's work, uh, The Racial Contract, uh, that talks about the, you know, the whiteness of the, the, yes, the whiteness of the social contract. And so I, I, I would start there. And, and I think it would put a, it would bring one to that question, I think, uh, from a different place. Thank you, thank you both. There's a, a question here that I think speaks to some of what Matt was saying earlier in his approaches to, to say Othello, for example, right, and wanting to bring in other, you know, certainly uh, uh, other voices, right, when teaching that. But this this looks at it more broadly. Amit uh, has has this uh, question: How to make sure critical white studies would not be all about white writers and critics that might once again render invisible black voice voices. Uh, that is, while our sources are mainly early modern white ones, can we find a way to make visible and heard early modern black writing in other contexts and languages, i.e. black authors writing about whiteness in Arabic, Turkish, Persian, Iberian context in the early modern world? Uh, that is, how to make possible not only a trans-historical, but also a trans-regional approach to whiteness and race in general in our fields that would disrupt centralizing Anglo-white voices and writing only. It's difficult, and it's difficult for a lot of reasons. Um, one, um, the language barrier does become an issue, um, especially as someone who is trained in an American Academy uh, speaking English. I have uh, attempted to do some some work in this field, and it's it's incredibly difficult. Um, to access the sources because uh, a lot of them aren't translated. That's not an excuse. Um, I mean, it is absolutely right that we need to sort of expand where these sources are coming from, but then we catch it on the other side. We have to justify our works to our jobs. And we are in a institution that is going to, if we write about Shakespeare, I get tenure. If I write about some writer from North Africa, no one's heard of, my committee is going to question it. 
So what happens is our, the, the strictures of capitalism, the neoliberal university and an anti-black university that values whiteness and white voices and white literature and white cultures, uh, even the written word as opposed to oral traditions uh, coerces us to write about certain things. Um, I don't like Shakespeare. It makes me money. Let's be perfectly clear about that. Um, there, there are thousands of contemporary playwrights who are more valuable to our times, but we do Shakespeare because it makes money. Um, so that's some of the pressure that we run into on the other side of this. So uh, he, he is absolutely correct in saying that we need to be able to write about this from a larger uh, sort of global perspective, get voices, not just read white people to find out what whiteness is, but hey, we've had people who are not white tell us, right, for centuries. Um, and it's about getting the institution to accept the value of that work and those voices, which is, um, I mean, let's be perfectly honest about what we are encountering here. Um, how, how many of us who are minorities in this room have been the only minority faculty member in their department, right? We are living in a world that still does not want us. We are not there because the university values us. We are there because the liberal uh, consciousness of America says that if we're not there, they'll stop giving money to the university, right? For most minority faculty members, our job is to make the university not look racist. So we have to, we have certain constrictions put on our work um, that unfortunately is the way of the world. And, you know, when we're talking about, Arthur was mentioning, you know, critiquing how SAA came to be what it is. Um, this is every institution in this country, academic, artistic, financial, right? How did they all come to be what they are? And unfortunately, it's, it's through the blood and death of, of a lot of the people on this panel and a lot of the people um, watching it. So yes, Hamid is absolutely right that this work needs to be done. The question becomes, what can the white scholars, the white chairs, the white full professors in this room do to make sure it's valued? Because they're not gonna listen to me when I tell them. Well, yeah, and, and just, just adding an amen to everything that Matt just said. And, and one of the moves, uh, I've heard about some of you, I'm sure have also heard about, is getting white institutions, white faculty, et cetera, to think, to look around the room and to say, wow, we are overly represented here. We are overly represented in this space. And not, oh, there is Matt, the, the black guy. It is, my God, there is Karen and Karen, uh, forgive me all the Karens out there, but it's like, there's Karen and Karen and Karen and Karen. How many Karens can, how many white Karens can there be, right? And so it's a change in that perspective. And I think one of the things that uh, Matt just touched on for me is how much the, is the kind of the, 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 kind, of the kind of brutal effect of that realization uh, for myself as a Shakespearean that, I wasn't there really to uh, do Shakespeare, uh, you know, to do the humanities. I was there to play nice for the institution, right? And that the that I was only as valued as as much as I understood what my particular place is and 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 was, right? And so no one expected or expect serious Shakespeare scholarship from me. Uh, and so in that sense, the, it, it, one of the, the really, I think, key issues here is, and it goes back to Kate's paper and thinking about the, about the humanities, is about the kind of white project of the humanities. And this does touch on what Matt was saying, that this is all over, you know, it's all over these institutions or what Peter was saying about the ivory tower. And it is, if we are having these, these conversations within institutions that are pretending that they're not, in a sense, they, they, they do, don't have some kind of white agenda, then there is nowhere for the conversation to go. It's like when we watch 
uh, debates, quote unquote, happening in our Congress or in our Senate these days. And we, and we know that the debate isn't real. We already know how they're all going to vote on the left and the right, et cetera, right? And, and this is what we do in the academy, right? It, is we pretend that we're actually, in a sense, having these explorations, but they come with these, param these very fixed parameters. And, those, and, and if one isn't in our field paying homage and you know, and these can be all kinds. And these can get disguised in all kinds of sophisticated ways and through all kinds of sophisticated theories. Uh, but if we are not at the end paying homage to uh, pick it up on Kate's paper to white history, then the problem is us, right? The problem is then we don't know what it is we're doing because all roads lead to white, you know, to uh, white adulation. And so what does it mean to have a humanities that is not about white adulation um, or a Shakespeare that is not about white adulation becomes almost unthinkable in the academy, right? And to me, that's, that's, that's a horror. Uh, thanks. Thank you for your candor too. I, I, I'm tempted to leave it on those two mic drops there. Um, your fantastic responses, but I, I, I do want to pick up on, and then we'll, uh, I think we got time for one one final question here that you know will involve the entire panel here. You know, uh, Matt saying this is the way of the world here. It's speaking of world here, right? The, the overarching theme of this panel. Uh, Drew, I think, presents a, a, an interesting question. He says, I, "I would love to hear more about the world-making component of this conversation. Uh, it seems most directly present in the rethinking of geohumoralism, insofar as it draws race out of the." climactic ecological surround and tries to think about a causal fantasy and project and projects race downwards outwards into a source in the non-human exteriority but there's more to say I'm sure about world as a seamless holistic form I have I, I don't want to over do too much here so I would just add one quick thing Ruben promise just one quick yeah yeah um again because I'm shameless and I like my plugs the introduction to white people in Shakespeare that's it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, no, and I would say on that, I mean, I think this is one reason that's critiquing the white texts as white is important, even though there is that danger, which I think we really do need to warn against, I agree, of recentering those texts, but but to like really look at those texts and the way that they really have worked and they work so hard to construct and to naturalize whiteness, right? And so, so I just think that those, um, and the way that they're constructing systems and ideologies and thinking like the legal system, thinking about religious frameworks, um, all kinds of different systems, economic systems that work to natural and the ideologies that accompany them that really are inherently white. And so if we're going to do the work, right, that Matthew is talking about of calling attention to whiteness, to the white people like myself, right, in the room and why they're in the room, um, that we need to I think be able to like unpack that. And so I, I just think that I guess kind of simply and, and Arthur explains this, you know, much more eloquently in the introduction to white people in Shakespeare, but just that like early modern text, like the, the project of the quote unquote Renaissance is a white world making pro project. And I think that attending to that is, is important if we are ever going to like shift away from something like the white humanities. Anyone want to add anything to that? I think, yes, I think on that note, I mean- I was saying that's the case, but anyway. <laughs> no, no, I, I think, uh, unless somebody wants to say, add anything here, I, I don't want to pull the plug here. Um, I, 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 yeah, I, I will just note that, I mean, that this is a moment and, and I think we recognize that not just in this panel, but recent panels at the SAA, uh, the culture of the SAA, right? And, you know, the, the value uh, that, that many are finding in, in these conversations. I, I, I think I could speak for so many in saying like how much, uh, how meaningful this is and, and how uh, intellectually stimulating this panel was and it's an ongoing conversation. So thank the four of you uh, really, you know, uh, for, for, for these amazing papers. Thank you, Arthur, for organizing this and thank you all for coming out, uh, you know, taking time out of your, your, your evenings or afternoons or, or mornings, wherever you might be uh, to tune in today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. Thank you. Bye. You too. Bye.